Oh, hi, Scott. How are you today? I'm good, Dimitri, and you? Nice to see you smile. Um, well, it's Saturday, and I'm putting some thought to this lecture that I have to give to our second year students. Uh, and I'm a little nervous because I only have like four weeks to the deadline. And gosh, our students are so smart. I want to do a good job. Um, there's lots of time. There's lots of time, but what, you know, you, what should I say about light and shadow? I, I, it, there is light and there is shadow. What more is there to the subject? Well, I mean, there's the material properties of light. Light and is material? <laughs> yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, it could be used like a material. Right. And it can make material visible and happen. What else can I say about light and shadow? Well, light, light and shadow also has a kind of social analog. What do you mean by social analog? That's, those are big words. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the world we live in right now, the degree to which we live in light and shadow. Oh, you mean like what's revealed to us and what's hidden from us? Mm -hmm. And then the revealing of the concealing, isn't that the function of architecture? Oh, you mean like architecture is in between light and shadow? Right. It's like architecture, light and shadow flows through it. Right. It's really important stuff, isn't it? Well, and your paintings are so beautiful. Have you shown the students them? Well, I think they're probably bored to death by now. <laughs> Not well, much. Really, they haven't seen them. God, I really appreciate your input. I'm going to get work on it right now. Okay. Well, I have to go now because I have a lot of work to do. So bye. Bye. Hi, folks. Uh, this is a lecture, a short lecture, hopefully, for second year architecture students at Ryerson University. Uh, required lecture. So you have no choice, but you need to watch this. We'll see how it goes. Uh, the subject matter I was asked to talk about was light and shadow, but um, I was thinking of a better title, maybe calling it something like Architecture, a Puppet Show, and you'll see why shortly. Um, light and shadow, like, what is there to know about the subject in relation to architecture? Uh, it, it's really more than just architecture, isn't it? It's about the environment in general. I suppose architecture is often thought of as, as a static art. Um, buildings are considered permanent uh, artifacts that exist in, in real time and space. Um, you could say that light and light is both a kind of constant. It, it's something you can count on day in, day out, but it's also the agent of change or the main agent of change. It's literally uh, the agent for all life uh, on earth. It, it obviously is required for growth, uh, for nutrients, but it's also, uh, it causes decay and, and regeneration. Uh, it's, the site, it's part of the cycle of life. In fact, if you're into cosmology, uh, uh, the sun is everything to us. Um, so light and its companion, uh, close companion, shadow, are also thought of in other ways. Uh, light illuminates, it's, an, it's certainly an agent of clarity and meaning, and it also marks our understanding of time and space, uh, day in, day out. It defines time and space. It's both kind of a welcome thing into our lives, but also, but it's also it needs to be contained or mediated and, and truly respected. Uh, for example, full exposure is not really an option. Uh, full exposure to the sun uh, is problematic, um, nor can we exist in the world of shadows and illusion alone. Um, I guess human existence itself um, uh, follows not a complete linear path between darkness to light and back to darkness again. Um, as architecture students, you might feel as if every day is a kind of revelation of form and ideas. You're constantly learning. Uh, uh, and becoming enlightened. I like to twin the two words um, uh, of idea and form in, in the discussion of light and shadow. Um, we're material artists. As architects, we're material artists. We work between thought, 
our interior space and, and being exterior space, um, inside and out. Uh, our bodies at first are really our bodies mediate these two states of existence. When we're born, we see only a few forms. Our mothers, uh, uh, we are fed uh, by an object. Our immediate blurry space around us uh, when, we're, when we're not young is all we know. As we grow though, and forms of knowledge are revealed to us through time, we experience um, what I would call boundaries of knowledge and limits that are defined by, certainly defined by the, the limits of our own senses, uh, defined by our bodies in real space. And of course, as we age, we reflect uh, another facet of light, reflection, on our accumulated knowledge um, and uh, our, our general world around us closes in on us. Interiority, <clears throat> the world of ideas, becomes the space we dwell in <clears throat> more and more as we get older until, of course, we dwell no more. Um, so what does that have to do with architecture? Uh, well, sort of continuing on the theme, light and shadow are often considered in, in Western civilization in binary terms, uh, light and dark, et cetera. But our, our experiences are not binary. They're not black and white. Our journeys through time and space are highly personal and nuanced. Perception is everything to us. Uh, the ability to see or know is truly a function of the science of perception and the art of interpretation. Uh, this is often discussed uh, as phenomenology. In the most general terms, architecture is the study of our built environment. Uh, perhaps in more narrow terms, architecture is the study of light representing life and shadow representing death, right? That's sort of kind of simple. Architects uh, and obviously non-architects uh, build the environment, build our environment to house both light and shadow and to establish boundaries between us, our bodies and our minds and the world outside our bodies and our minds. We mediate, uh, architects are mediators or architecture mediates and architecture uh, is of course a human construct. Um, so, this is really an architectural reading of Plato's parable of the cave, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, whereby Socrates illustrates the general essence of dwelling in the world. The parable goes something like this. Imagine being yourself being chained to a wall with the view of only the interior of the cave. Behind you, out of sight is a fire and on the wall that you see are shadows cast by that fire, like puppet shadows on the walls. Uh, the shapes of silhouetted objects are all you can see, and therefore all you know of reality. That's what's given to you. That's what your eyes can see. Imagine then suddenly being released to the world directly outside of the cave. So at first you're you're blinded by the light and it, it takes a long while before your eyes can adjust to take in this new reality. To begin with, all you see is your own shadow on the ground at first, but then as you adjust to the new condition, you start to take in other forms and information or knowledge. Uh, returning to the cave, if you return to the cave, you'll, you'll probably try and explain this new knowledge to your friends still in the world of puppet shadows, but they really don't understand you and how could they? So you decide to leave them as you kind of have to, to continue your journey uh, outside of the cave, your journey in the world. The parable, Plato's parable of the cave, um, as Socrates, Socrates is, the, is the storyteller and Plato is the, the scriber, uh, the parable charts the various disciplines of knowledge, starting with empirical sciences and, and moving away or beyond through philosophy, which is or was a kind of science above all other sciences. I suppose that's debatable. Uh, the point is that the, our journeys never truly end and there's always something beyond our reach. 
truth or reality is something that is quite evasive and it takes a lot of a lot of effort and perhaps courage to keep going in this journey of life. Um, it's a struggle. Uh, so for example, your professors may sound like they know a lot, but really they're just on their own personal journeys, just as you are. Sometimes um, we all find it more comforting to return to the cave, um, you know, the TV or the internet or the cave and, and look at the puppet shadows on the walls created by artists. We watch movies. All media, uh, regardless of, of the technology from books to pictures, art itself, architecture, TV, the World Wide Web, are mere, they're all merely uh, shadows uh, or cast shadows, projected shadows like puppets of reality, puppetry. Um, another way of thinking about it is that they're kind of like portals to knowledge. So architecture is a portal, but also boundaries where knowledge is hidden uh, on purpose. Uh, because like looking directly into the source of our life, the sun, it might be too much for our eyes to take in the sun, but we'll go blind. We also need architecture to mediate between the outside and the inside in the same way. Sometimes uh, knowledge is unknowable. We don't know everything. Nobody knows everything. And other times it's designed to manage and control us, which is a really important current subject when you're thinking about uh, the age of the digital revolution and the internet, et cetera. Think carefully about the source of light and shadows as presented to you and as you choose to design. What was the intention of the puppeteer, the artist, the architect? Was it to inform us about the truth, to, uh, to enlighten us, or to shape the truth into forms that control and manage us? Imagine, again, being back in the cave, chained to it, uh, and being controlled uh, by the images that are projected. And that's the story of the world as presented to you, after all, we're prisoners in the cave. And that's actually the parable of the cave as well. They're prisoners that are chained to the cave. This is really politics. So if you think of it that way, all of our human constructs, all of what we build architecture is political. Nature itself is a human construct. We have kind of placed ourselves outside of nature, or rather we are inside the technologies architecture included, um, looking out at it. So now I'd like to talk about some examples, um, just a few examples uh, to illustrate these, these ideas. Um, and I'm breaking them down into five topics and, all, and five corresponding examples. The first one is light and shadow in relation to tectonics. Um, the second one is light and shadow in relation to form. Uh, light and shadow in relation to materials would be the falling one. And the fourth one in relation to space or place. And finally, um, uh, a reference to uh, emotion. I, I, a lot of our students um, in the Pavilion Project wanted to do wanted to affect people's experiences emotionally. And so that, that's a word that seems to come up a lot. And I, I just want to reference a non-architectural project, a film uh, that, that does it quite well and a very famous director. So to start with uh, tectonics, the example I'm, I'm going to use to illustrate uh, the use of light in tectonics is a well-known uh, artist uh, who works as an architect, really. There, it's quite blurry. And that is, of course, James Turrell. So the interesting thing about this work uh, here illustrated uh, uh, by a project at the University of Austin is, uh, is that, you know, it is just a hole in the ceiling on one level, and it is just minimally experiencing the change in light conditions from day through the next day. And also interior, the interior, he do, does use a lot as well he does with synthetic or artificial light 
And you can see that that's the case here between these two pictures and how how he sets up this experience to 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 change. Uh, and these are just two glimpses. Um, but what I think most people miss is that this is really an exercise in tectonics. Uh, what makes that what makes it work, and it probably took him many, many years to figure this out, is that architecturally, in terms of the construction of this space, that hole in the ceiling looks like a line. How often have you ever seen that in a building? Not very often. Um, it is just a line because the way he's detailed um, the roof is that you don't see the thickness of the roof. It comes to a sharp edge. Why is that important? Well, without that tectonic move, um, you would not get the experience of the sky and the interior space collapsing into a kind of a flat plane, which is the ceiling. So that, um, and you could probably pull up YouTube videos of, 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 of these experiences. These are, I'm just showing you stills, but you, you could, even in these stills, you can, you can get the sense that that circle in the ceiling it looks like a painting or it looks like a static or a flat image of a sky on a white ceiling. Um, and then on the, well, that would be on the left side. On the right side, it looks like, it looks like a moon or an object. It, it, you, it, it's ambiguous, it's highly ambiguous. So spaces are, it's not just about the sun moving around the room, but it's actually very specific qualities of, of light sky, eye and sky relationship, whereby he, he, the effect is that the sky is essentially compressed into the space. So it, it, it's flattened in a sense, which is, which is really interesting. So the second precedent I'd, I'd like to show you is a, also a well-known precedent. Uh, we often return to Le Corbusier to, to illustrate ideas in architecture because it, it, his work over the decades that he practiced ranges so greatly from from rational city concepts to you know top down sort of uh, uh, thinking in architecture to ground uh, architecture that comes from the ground up or ideas about perception materiality and 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 what I would refer to as kind of ira the irrational uh, aspects of of architecture uh, things that aren't sort of quantifiable but experienced. Uh, so Ronchamp is an excellent way to illustrate our, uh, um, light and shadow in relation to form. Uh, in this case, you can see the, this lovely little diagram, which if you really zoom in on it, you could, you'll see the credit for it, um, is about different kinds of use of light, individual light and collective light to express the congregation both as a collective experience and an individual experience. The picture on the left is so dramatic, so is the one on the right. Uh, the one on the left is a sort of light emanating from the heavens, very dramatically on what looks to be, I'm not Catholic, but what looks to be uh, some sort of sanctuary. Um, altar, altar is the word that I was looking for. And the one on the right, of course, uh, is this sort of pixelization of the environment emanating from outside to in. And you know, through the use of, of color, stained glass windows, you, you get this sort of um, uh, individual uh, expression of, of light as if he's breaking down the light into individual particles in reference to Einstein earlier. Now, so the third precedent um, that I want to show you is, let me just go back to my notes. Here we go. Uh, light and shadow in relation to materials. Um, the example that I'm is going back to art. Uh, uh, we were we started with art. We went to Le Corbusier, and now we're going to go back to another artist who also, you know, blurs the distinction between architecture and, and art making. That's Richard Serra, which is also uh, been shown and talked about. But I'm again going to illustrate it in a slightly different way. So here, he is working with just one material. Uh, in his torqued ellipses, the material of choice in all his projects actually is Cortan steel, a very uh, heavy material. Uh, it is a shipbuilding material. In fact, he started off his career working in, in steel or metal fabrication of, of ships. That was, you know, that's what he did for a living. And then he used 
very naturally, he used what he was working with in, in his day job and, and, and brought it to his art practice. And I think that's not an unimportant point. It, it's, it's very interesting that he gravitated to something that he had experienced with. So the point about using him using this material to achieve these effects is that um, there is a, a transformative aspect to his work in, in that um, the viewer, the participant, when they enter the space, I mean, from the outside, you you certainly experience the heaviness of these forms. They're usually, they're mostly outwardly um, heavy and, and then things happen when after you enter them. Upon entering it, you, what you begin to see, similar to Le Corbusier, is these sort of light patterns, shadows uh, cast from, from natural light down into the space. Of course, it changes, but the, the material of the metal actually perception in terms of perception it actually dematerializes and what takes on form uh, is the is the material of light so this is a really good illustration of light as a material uh, there are other examples and there are architectural examples as well um, I, I would urge you to look at the work in general of, of uh, Stephen Hall uh, another great use of materials in architecture more locally, uh, certainly very rich traditions of really material use in a kind of craft way is the work of Shem uh, I've talked to my students a lot about their projects and encourage you all to become familiar with not just international precedents, but local precedents as well. The fourth example of the use of light and shadow that I want to just touch on today is a lesser known architectural project um, uh, known as the Sundial Folly by Figueredo and Fung from the early 90s in Toronto. Again, another uh, Toronto precedent that this is a project that is not that well known uh, uh, to, to people, including uh, academics, and, but it, it is one of my favorite uh, uh, projects. Um, it, I would say that amongst many things, it does illustrate light and shadow in relation to space and placemaking. So it's called a sundial folly because it is a, uh, it is a sundial that uh, is in this, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ledoux style of the sphere, this concrete sphere with a slit down the entire periphery, which is actually the sundial part where the sun comes in and marks time on the inside face. Uh, it's all set up in a kind of scarpa-like way, where you 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 approach this 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 place, and there's a water uh, that's being. It's also a waterfall. It's being. It relates to Lake Ontario. It sits on Lake Ontario in the harbor. Uh, you walk over water. You you have plants, uh, re, uh, water plants growing there, and there's this bridge that you ascend uh, in a in a promenade towards and into the sundial itself. And then you walk through the sundial and emerge again. Um, so it is an experience from light to dark, back to light again. And it actually has a function. It, it's a clock. Um, not sure that anyone needs it to be used as a clock. Um, uh, this was designed before the smartphone, um, but not before watches. Um, so, you know, not only is this a really interesting uh, example of light and shadow, in, in creating a place or space, i.e. the, the interior of the, of the sphere, uh, but it also, also demonstrates all the other principles that I was talking about. Material, this is a really rich palette of uh, steel, concrete, organic materials, and water. Uh, of course, light is a material. So uh, this project could actually be used to illustrate all of the, the different aspects of, of architecture and the use of light and shadow. So the fifth element uh, that I mentioned earlier that I want to talk about is emotion and how that seems to be uh, something, a word that students use a lot. And um, today I'm just going to use a, a filmic example of a, a designer, a director who used light and shadow to incredible uh, effect emotionally. And that of course is Alfred Hitchcock in his movie Vertigo, there are other other scenes and other movies that we could use. Uh, but Hitchcock was very much um, a director that utilized architecture as, a, as another character in his movies. 
uh, in this case, you could see, um, you know, the, this dramatic effect of this fellow ascending, descending uh, a staircase with with the, the feeling of vertigo or or fear, you know, fear of of heights and and. It is not only effective in the movie, but it's also really effective as a still image. Um, so it, it does look like a Piranesi uh, uh, drawings. The uh, the uh, series, I think there were twelve images that Piranesi used to uh, to explore classical architecture ruins uh, in an interior way. I I don't know if Hitchcock studied Piranesi, but I think. Uh, he might have. Finally, I'd like to end this short lecture by reading a, a passage from um, a book by a Japanese author named Tanizaki. Uh, the short book is really a personal account, um, reflections of a sort on his on his preferred topics, architecture being one of them. Uh, um, he explores architectural tectonics, uh, space, light and shadow, uh, interior finishes, crafts, um, and, and the art of impermanence. Uh, Tanizaki's beautiful descriptions are a kind of uh, sad lament on traditional Japanese architecture. Um, things like lacquerware uh, by candlelight, um, monastic toilets, uh, which he describes with such beauty, um, traditional Japanese embroidery in gold. Um, and, and of course, he talks a bit about Japanese paper versus Western paper. Um, the essay depicts the, the main differences between shadows and dimness of traditional Japanese architecture interiors uh, versus the dazzling light of modern architecture, Western architecture. Uh, this little book has in total 16 sections. Um, and I guess it's really just an overall uh, uh, exploration of Japanese aesthetics. Um, and of course, in contrast with, with change, i.e progress, uh, modernity. Um, comparisons of light with darkness are used to compare um, and contrast traditional Asian and modern cultures, modern Western cultures. Uh, so this short passage that I'll read is on the use of lacquerware. Uh, lacquerware is made of wood, uh, painted wood. Lacquerware decorated in gold is not something to be seen in a brilliant light, but to be taken in at a single glance. It should be left in the dark, a part here and a part there picked up by a faint light. Its florid patterns recede into darkness, conjuring in their stead an inexpressible aura of depth and mystery, of overtones but partly suggested. The sheen of the lacquer set out in the light reflects the wavering candlelight, announcing the drafts that find their way from time to time into the quiet room, the tea room, luring one into a state of reverie. If the lacquer is taken away, much of the spell disappears from the dream world but built by that strange light of candle and lamp that wavering light beating the pulse of the night. Indeed, the thin, impalpable, faltering light picked up as though little rivers were running through the room, collecting little pools here and there, lacquers, a pattern on the surface of the night itself. So that concludes our, our short lecture on shadow and light. I hope it's useful. If you have any questions, feel free to fire them off. Uh, either in person or electronically. Uh, see you in class.